St. Lawrence and its hundred affluents in the central provinces. From the shores of the Great Lakes, from the wheat fields of the West, from the fruitful slopes and broad acres of the Pacific coast, Canadians rallied to the call. No spirit of glory or conquest led them to forsake the peace of hearth and home for the privations and the sufferings of war. The royal visit of 1939 brought the Bureau out in full force, and the sequence of Their Majesty's Day in Quebec City nicely reflected those simpler and more innocent days. Three little maids in white bring tangible evidence of their affection, a floral tribute for Her Majesty the Queen. All rules of protocol learned in hours of patient rehearsing must be observed, of course. The tots advance on their exalted mission with dignity that runs into some difficulties. Now the Queen leads the way from the platform and the wonders of this day of days are at an end. Quebec has seen and has been conquered by the democratic graciousness of their king and queen. Despite these few bursts of glory, the government bureau was not a very exciting place to work. Any attempts at creativity and innovation were generally stifled by hidebound government bureaucrats, and the product soon became stultifyingly dull and old-fashioned. The High Commissioner to London, Vincent Massey, reported that he was appalled by the lack of appeal of Canadian government films in circulation. The Bureau was headed by Captain Frank Badgley, whose spirit was gradually broken by the Ottawa bureaucracy. I remember Badgley got very low one night, he and I were talking and sipping. He said, you know, they'll give me enough money to pay all my salaries, and they won't give me any money to keep those fellows busy. He says, that doesn't make sense. I always thought of that remark. That's what he was really up against. With the result that towards the end, he got into that frame of mind. Well, I don't care. Let them pay me, and if that's what they're, they want. I think a good man, but it didn't have the uh, fire that it needed, partly because the government wouldn't let them do anything. It all had to fit within a pattern. The sun shone more brightly on Victoria, B.C. During the 1930s, this little city was the unlikely movie capital of the North. The British government had recently established a quota system. Under it, a Hollywood producer who wanted to show his films in the United Kingdom had to make a certain proportion of them in the British Commonwealth. Victoria was the closest Commonwealth city to California, and so Hollywood set up a branch plant to satisfy the British requirements. They built a studio in the horse barns at Victoria's exhibition grounds and proceeded to grind out some very cheap films, which soon became known as the Coda Quickies. Such was Secrets of Chinatown. You have come to me in a worthy cause. Except for that, these doors would never have opened before you. Seek to save life, to bring an end to those who would ravish mankind. As you see, it's a mountain on the west coast of Vancouver Island. It's a lonely, godforsaken spot used by the Indians as a hunting ground. I haven't the least doubt that that's the place we're looking for. Well, we'll route them out this time, Don. Mm, it'll need more subtlety than that, I'm afraid. They have guards. They disappear long before ever you got near the mountain. No. My idea is this. We pack across Vancouver Island and approach false ears from the rear. There I'll contact Rand. We've got to save that lad. And the girl, too. You shall watch your lover start his journey. Thank you, Zeke. White. 
Chantal Link? I shall be the last person your eyes shall look upon. Chandalin, you're under arrest. I regret, Mr. Commissioner, I must disappoint you. I go in my own way alone. This is deadly poison. I shall be dead in a few minutes. And, Mr. Commissioner, if I have made you look rather foolish, pray accept my apologies. Mr. Dawn, you are a brilliant man. I admire you, and I honor you. Gentlemen of the police, you have been very kind. I regret I must cheat you. Oh. <laughs> The negative of this particular film was seized by the sheriff for payment of debts, and Bishop quietly disappeared. He soon resurfaced, however, and once again set up shop in the horse barns of Victoria. He established a new company and churned out about a dozen quota quickies for the British market between 1935 and 1938. They had such titles as Tugboat Princess, Death Goes North, Manhattan Shakedown. A few of the smaller parts were played by local talent, but the leading roles were taken by B-picture actors from Hollywood. Their last film, The Convicted, featured a Hollywood starlet by the name of Rita Hayworth. Aggie went out a few minutes ago. Uh, do you know when she'll be back? She ain't far. Just shopping across the street. In that store. There she is, look. Don't get her. murdered as sure as I'm born to shut her mouth. Can't you see? First of all, she was bribed. And then as soon as the trial is safely over, she's put out of the way for good. Yeah, it begins to smell like rain. There's somebody big behind all this, somebody with plenty of influence and money. And what are you going to do about it? I don't know yet, but whoever this somebody is, with Aggie dead and Baker gone, he's completely covered up his tracks. Films from the Victoria horse barns were being shown in British theaters because they had to show a certain percentage of Commonwealth movies. They were being shown, however, in the mornings to charwomen, with American movies being run for the paying customers in the afternoons and evenings. The quota system had been established so that Britain and her Commonwealth would have a movie industry of their own and not be totally overwhelmed by Hollywood. The now infamous quota quickies made by a branch plant of a Hollywood studio rather defeated that purpose. In the British House of Lords, the Canadians were specifically denounced for permitting flagrant abuses of the system. A somewhat disgusted British government decided it would no longer accept movies made in the Commonwealth as part of the quota. The horse barns of Victoria were restored to their rightful occupants. The Trenton Studios had already been converted to a dry cleaning plant. Some Canadians undoubtedly felt that both buildings now served more useful purposes. But there were the others who still believed in dreams. There was a man named Booth, J.R. Booth, a little chap who uh, promoted a, a feature which he made in segments over a long period of time, every time he got a little bit of money. And they used all sorts of places for their location shots. I remember hearing about using the boiler room at Eaton's to represent the sewers of Paris or something. And he uh, gradually got very grandiloquent ideas. He was going to build a studio city. 
and he had a big roll of blueprints that he carried around with him. Unfortunately, though, I saw the blueprints. It must have been gotten from some construction company because they were for a bank and a store. And, but these uh, represented the great studio that he hoped someday to build. Whatever happened to him, I don't know, but it, it was interesting the way he worked for his ideal, his goal. The Pioneers in Dreamland. Gordon Sparling, Roy Tash, Frank Badgley, Bill Oliver, Jack Chisholm, a very small company of men. The Second World War was about to break out, and Canada, with the establishment of the National Film Board and a new group of small private companies, was about to become one of the most prolific and respected makers of documentary film in the world. But in 1939, the movie industry in Canada was a wasteland, inhabited by but a very few brave and lonely souls. And I remember uh, Cowboy Keen. And the poor fellow had very little money, and he would make a little money one way or another, and then make another scene of the, of the film. And that went on for years. I don't know whether he ever did get the picture finished, but it was certainly a good example of somebody with a burning light ahead of him trying to accomplish something. In many respects, a bleak and somewhat shabby world, beset by cheap politicians, pompous bureaucrats, and greedy promoters, and by an indifferent Canadian public who seemed more interested in watching Shirley Temple than they were in watching themselves, all of which lent a certain nobility to those few Canadian movie people who endured and refused to surrender the dream. <laughs>